All right, let me tweet, tweet something first. <laughs> We're going live. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. My first time in Stockholm, and um, I love it. So thank you for the invite. As, uh, as Karen said, um, about five or six years ago, I set out on this mission to fill social media with art. And uh, it's been a fascinating journey that led me to share millions of pieces of art. It connected me with a vibrant community of artists, creators, and educators. And it filled my life with more art than I thought possible. So uh, as the title suggests, this talk is about bots, social media, and hopefully by the end, I can convince you guys that you too need a bot. All right. So, uh, so this journey started back in, oh, before I go, you can follow, so the, the author of the slide is right here, and you can follow me on Twitter. So if you want to follow Chagall, go to Twitter and, oh, no, it's not Chagall, it's Malevich. I'm looking at the next slide. Anyway, so this is the format. So you can follow the artist here. All right. This journey started back in 2012 with a realization of how utterly devoid of art my life has become. Uh, having grown up in Russia in a family of artists, I was surrounded by art. Names like Kandinsky, Malevich, Chagall, they were the household names. Uh, as a child, I spent days in my father's art studio and then attended an, an art university as a young adult. But things changed when I moved to the US and pursued a career in software. Art was just not a part of my life. And for almost 10 years, I didn't paint rarely visited museums, and pretty much lost all contact with the art world. I missed it. So naturally, I turned to social media in search of ways to reconnect with the art community. I went on Twitter and typed the name of my favorite artist, Vasily Kandinsky, into Twitter's search bar. I discovered that plenty of people shared Kandinsky's work, but there wasn't a central account for the artist that I could simply follow. The art came at me from multiple different directions. I also discovered that there was a selection bias. People tended to share the most famous artworks for the artists, ignoring a large body of lesser known art. I felt, you know, a lot of context was missing. All art is interconnected. Artists follow each other, bore ideas, and yet the accounts I follow, they were disjointed. Whoever shared Kandinsky's work didn't connect it with Klee or Munta. Again, a lot of context was lost. And lastly, when I'd followed somebody for the art they shared, I would also get their personal and political posts. Like, why can't I just follow art without seeing pictures of your cat or how much you love or hate Donald Trump? And so um, the famous art meme says, if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it. But I felt things were very Baroque. Uh, I wanted to have a pure art experience, a slow but continuous trickle of art in my feed. And so I started to think, wait a minute, maybe I can build a bot for Kandinsky. So, so this is the point in the story where all my American friends are like, wait a minute, what is it with Russians and their bots? <laughs> I actually do not know. I guess Russians just have a thing for bots. M moving on, so let me explain what a bot is. So a bot is a social media account that runs on autopilot. It, it's uh, just like a regular account, uh, only its behavior is driven by a set of algorithms. So you can pretty much program a bot to do anything, share posts, to retweet the, retweet the posts of others. And uh, in order to build a bot, you need a few things. You need a uh, software program that define what it does, a server to run that program, and a social media account. Then you connect it all together and you magically have a bot. Uh, I didn't have much expectations for my first bot. I mainly built, built it to educate myself about Kandinsky and see his art in my feed. To my surprise, other people started following the account, reposting and discussing the art it shared. The biggest surprise that was that nobody cared that Kandinsky was a bot. People just loved seeing art in their feeds, and it did not matter whether it was shared by a bot or a human. Actually, in some important ways, 
bots are better suited for sharing large amounts of data. They never forget, their sh sharing choices are not colored by their personal biases, and their behavior can be endlessly improved. And so Kandinsky went on sharing his art, but there's still one big problem. He was lonely, none of his friends were around. If Kandinsky was really on Twitter, wouldn't he follow other artists from the Bauhaus, the Blue Rider, or the Russian avant-garde? And so I added accounts for Paul Klee, Gabriel Munta, Franz Marc, and a bunch of others. I connected them together and trained them to retweet each other's post, posts, recommend each other to their respective audiences, share relevant news, etc. Kandinsky had friends, he was happy. The network of dead artists kept on growing because over the years I have added more and more accounts. And in building that network, I tried to mimic the real connections artists of the past had socially or stylistically. For example, Jackson Pollock is connected to Lee Krasner. Kandinsky is connected to Lee. Gauguin is connected to Van Gogh. Those two still fight on Twitter, but most of the time they keep things civil. So over the next four years, I have added uh, close to 1,000 accounts on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr, and some on Pinterest. You can now follow anyone from Da Vinci to de Kooning. In addition to individual artists, my bots are sharing art from the museum collections, like National Museum, Rijksmuseum, SMK, Guggenheim, The Met, and a bunch of others. Last month alone, these art bots have shared 150,000 pieces of art to an audience of about 7 million art lovers on Facebook and uh, Twitter and Tumblr. So every second, so get this, every second somebody engages with a piece of art shared through these accounts. That ups at, blah, blah, blah. The, this adds up to about 3 million engagements per month, which is nuts. So in technical terms, I'm running a botnet a network of bots controlled from a central place. Unfortunately, social media botnets have gained infamy during the last presidential election in the US, Brexit, and you know, a few other European elections. Although similar in form, these botnets are very different in substance. So instead of spreading misinformation and fear, my bots are inspiring and educating Instead of contaminating people's feeds with spam and clickbait, my bots are infusing them with beauty and creativity. Instead of appealing to tribalism and sowing division, my bots are bringing people together, uniting them around the shared love of art. I'm often surprised how uh, people from the opposite sides of a political spectrum, who otherwise cannot stand each other, engage in, engage in deep and meaningful conversations around art. And for many, Seeing art in their feeds is like a breath of fresh air. Uh, it's almost like these artists of the past continue to invoke the best in us through their art. And as for Kandinsky, he has never been more popular than today. Uh, apparently, you don't need to be alive to be a social media influencer. All right, so um, now that kind of you understand at a high level what it is, you know, what a bot is. Let me walk you through the process of creating a bot, and I'll describe the steps I used for um, when I made one for a national museum. So the very first step is to decide what type of content to share, and this can be anything. Artworks, text files, photographs, videos. Uh, in the case of national museum, things were easy. I downloaded the entire archive from Europeana into my app, and that data already included necessary titles, links, metadata. So then I created accounts for the National Museum on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, and connected them to my app. And those are really the only manual steps in the process. Everything else happens automatically. An algorithm determines the optimal, optimal number of posts to share on each social network. So the number of posts shared on Twitter is different from Facebook, which is different from Tumblr. The key point here is that each social network operates uh, according to a unique set of rules. So it's important to optimize for those rules and um, take them into account. So next, the bot figures out the most optimal times to share the content. So the times are picked based on the time, time zone in which the bot operates, 
day of the week, and a few other variables. Uh, the important, this is important because the half-life of a post on Twitter is roughly 24 minutes. So basically, if, you, if your post, if the post you've shared is not seen within the time, it virtually disappears. So if you have only a few posts to share during the day, it makes sense to be strategic about when to share them. National Museum's uh, data set on Europeana is close to 8,000 images. So how does the bot know which of those images to share? At first, the process has a lot of randomness. It basically picks an artwork it hasn't shared before and puts it out. But then, as it shares more content and collects the engagement data on everything, on, on how people liked it and interacted with it, it refines its choices and makes better sharing decisions. And as far as the scheduling goes, that's it. The bot runs, scheduling new content and sharing new art every day. But these accounts, so successful social media accounts, they don't just share, right? They follow other accounts, they um, retweet interesting content. So how does National Museum's bot know who to follow? So I use two methods to determine connections between the accounts. They can either follow each other based on visual similarity or thematic similarity. So for example, um, Claude Monet follows other impressionists like Renoir, Pissarro, Sisley, and National Museum's account follows other similar museum collections like Mauritius, SMK, Rex Museum. So once those connections are created, the accounts start reposting each other's art. And this is important because social media networks, they're optimized for connections. Uh, most content discovery actually happens through reposts. So, you know, the co more content variability there is, the better. So I briefly mentioned that I collect uh, the engagement data for everything these bots share. And again, you know, engagement is every time somebody likes a post or retweets a post or comments with the posts. So these metrics help to determine interesting and trending content in your collection. Only the content deemed interesting by your followers gets reposted by other accounts. So think of it in a way as crowdsourced curation of your content. And by reposting the account or deemed interesting by the users, you get even more engagement. So it's kind of like self-feeding loop. So at this point, you can leave this bot alone and it will go on doing its thing hopefully forever. But, um, but if you want to take things to the next level, you would need to bring a human into the, into the process. So not only bots and humans can exist side by side, but they can also amplify each other's efforts through a productive co collaboration. Uh, by taking over the repetitive and computationally intensive tasks, bots free up human social media managers to focus their time where it really counts, uh, engaging with the audience, reviewing um, analytical insights collected by the bots, and uh, creating more content. So in short, instead of replacing humans, bots make them more productive. Um, and this is precisely how this human is able to run a thousand accounts. One human, thousand bots. All right, so, so through doing this, I have identified a set of you know, kind of rules and best practices that I want to share with you in case you guys ever thinking about bots. All right, so the first, the, 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 the most important thing is that don't over curate your collection. Start sharing, even if your data is incomplete or the images are in lower quality. Even the content that might not seem interesting to you will be interesting to someone else. So the key point is to start sharing and bring the audience into the process. And you will be surprised what kind of stuff people point out, right? If you have a typo, if you have you know, a misplaced tag, they'll find it and they'll let you know. So if you have a fairly large collection, it makes sense to split it into several distinct accounts. So um, actually, one of my first museum bots was uh, bots for the Met. Uh, the part that Loic worked on. And so when I did those bots for the Met, I split them by museum department. So, so medieval art, modern art, photography, etc. So this allows your audience to self-organize around the content they're interested in. It enables you to target very specific groups. So for example, if you have um, you know, a new uh, expressionism exhibition coming up, you'll know exactly which segment of your social media audience to target. 
So even though people have multiple social media accounts, they don't split their time evenly between them. Your audience on Twitter is very different from your audience on Facebook, which is different from your audience on Pinterest. So it makes sense to duplicate those accounts, but treat them as separate entities. So if you have the same account on Twitter as on Facebook, post different content at different times, and otherwise, just be mindful of very specific rules uh, of those networks. As I mentioned earlier, the half-life of, of a post on social media is very short. Figure out which content performed better and uh, repost it across different accounts. People respond to the content they know. Uh, the most followed artists are Monet, Van Gogh, Rembrandt. So use the stars to create the initial engagement to draw people in and then introduce them to lesser known art. There are also several important things to avoid, as the great leader suggests. Birds. <laughs> I've been banned from Facebook more times than I can count, and all because of nudity or even things confused for nudity by the vision AI. So Google classified this image as highly sensitive. So this is from the National Museum. Uh, the AI must have a thing for birds. But seriously, don't get yourself banned or downranked by posting something that will scandalize Facebook's um, censorship robots. Most classical paintings are probably fine, but it's always good to exercise caution. Because in the world, of, in the world when um, censorship is delegated to an algorithm, the line between art and porn is apparently really hard to detect. All right. Even though you can technically share up to 2,400 posts on Twitter a day, I uh, suggest against that. Be mindful of your followers and their experience. When overshared, even art can be perceived as spam. Engage with people only when they engage with you first, right? So don't auto-follow, auto-message, auto-reply. Um, be like a vampire and wait to be invited in. So if you follow these recommendations, you'll be off to a good start, and um, your social media will, pr will grow, presence will grow, and you will probably won't get banned. So, so how does this all fit into the discussion we're having here? Um, we now live in the world where more and more glams are opening their archives, and the problem is no longer the lack of content, but its abundance. How can one take it all in? We can't expect users to spend hours on museum websites clicking through a mountain of content. Bots offer a unique solution to this problem. Instead of waiting for people to come to you, we can push art and content into their social media feeds. Instead of presenting them with thousands of images, we can let them to sub subscribe to a social media feed of their choice and receive that trickle of good and continuous content. And I believe that museums, as uh, custodians of our cultural heritage, have an important role to play in, in the world of social media. Uh, yes, social networks created big problems for our society, but they also created new opportunities. And with archives full of great content, museums can engage users in new and uh, creative ways. And bots are here to help. And so, it's been my personal mission to fill, to fill social media with art, bring these artists of the past into our daily conversations, erase institutional boundaries between the collections, and share all art regardless of the fact uh, who owns it or where it is housed. Pursuing this mission has had its difficulties, but it's been so worth it because in the end, these seconds we spend looking at art slowly add up to minutes and then hours and then days and eventually to a fuller and richer life, and this is something we can all benefit from, well, at least us humans. So, thank you. Thank you very much for this, and uh, thank you for <laughs> like picking us all up again after this, this sort of slightly overlong break. Um, I was thinking about one question um, for a long time, and that is obviously, as Andrea said, like um, there's there's those rules that bring you down after all this inspiration. Have you ever sort of thought about that there might be problems with how the common copyright looks like with your bots sharing all that art that? 
partly still is copyright protected? Yeah, so um, I haven't received a cease and desist yet, but um, most of the usage falls under fair use. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I make sure that I, when I share something, I make sure that I point to the original source with the link. And so I haven't had any, uh, any issues with that because most of the content I share really comes from a public source. So I can always point to a, to a source and say, hey, this is where I took the content from. Okay, and uh, obviously you haven't encountered any sort of discussion that um, suggested that you should be more cautious about this. Uh, not yet. No. I mean, most people don't probably don't even know uh, the things happening. That's probably what it is. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm asking because I also I think I want to point out how this concept of copyright is totally not um, sort of fitting our realities anymore because right. I don't I don't think anybody sees anything. Um, strange with all those art pairing. Another question would be, <laughs> there was an incident um, on Twitter in Sweden <clears throat> a couple of months ago when, when a policeman reacted on a bot of a, um, um, a poet who said something about how surveillance does not um, help with control and security but it actually helps insecurity huh. and that is that was it was a bot and it was a quote from her work and the woman has been dead since 1940 but this policeman interacted with her as if she was alive have you had anything like that like people get sort of irritated by what your bots share and that they go into animated discussions with the bot oh my god all the time so uh, <laughs> yeah this happens more than you think and um, so Lucian Freud for example he is the worst offender. People message him all the time, like all <laughs> kinds of things, uh, you know. And, and, and yeah, like I had, um, you know, the, the most, the funniest thing is that um, somebody messaged the auto, you know, auto digs bot on Facebook and uh, this heavy metal band and they're like, hey man, we really like your stuff. Can you design a t-shirt for our band? And it took me a while to tell him, hey, like it's, he died 50 years ago, but um, you know, but it happens all the time, and it's kind of also, uh, you know, reminds me that we live in, in this bubble, right? That most people they have no idea who Otto Dix is, they have no idea like who Modigliani is, and um, yeah, the, those bots invited to exhibit in, in galleries, those bots get invited to uh, do shows and and all kinds of stuff, and people ask questions about their art, and even even questioning their you know uh, style or sanity. Even though you know it's like, well, these these collections, right, that I'm sharing, they're already critically acclaimed, and it's it's classical art. But some of this art is apparently still too uh, risque for today's world. So, in some people's view, what, what happens when reality kicks in when they realize that he can't do a teacher for the band? Oh, disappointment. Okay. <laughs> oh, he's dead. Okay, there was a question here from the audience. I'll j just give the mic to you, and then I'll ask you to share it with you because I'm gonna try to get the next presentation on. Do you want me to get out of your way? No, that's fine. You need to stay there. I mean, you don't need to stay there, but you can try. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks for a really uh, great presentation, Andre. I was wondering, uh, you, you sort of cautioned us to uh, not scandalize the algorithms of, uh, of uh, social media, but uh, I thought back to uh, the, the big case around uh, L'Origine du Monde uh, by um, Courbet yep. that was uh, banned from Facebook and the French government went into that saying, hey, this is French, like canonized art, you can't ban this. I was wondering as a sector, as a, like a, a, a community of, of specialists, shouldn't we be challenging these algorithms that are trying to uh, scandalize uh, art? Yeah, I, I think we should, and I think that's you know something we need to do. Uh, in my case, what happens is that they just ban me from the platform, and there's no you know recourse, so there's no discussion. It's it's essentially an algorithm triggers a set of events that they suspend you, and there's no part of the process that you should be uh, you know that you can uh, interact with it. The bigger problem and. Um, What's happening is that when somebody's banned for the art they shared, it's kind of the last step. What you don't see is that if an algorithm says, hey, there's something that not everybody's going to enjoy, they deprioritize it. Mm. So basically, less people see it and nobody knows. So, so this algorithmic censorship, I think it not only changes the way that people who share art 
act, but it also changes the way that people perceive art, right? So only a small, uh, so what Facebook does, right, for everything you share, an algorithm determines uh, a score. You know, and, and I don't know this for sure, but, but, but so anyway, and base, based on the score, they say, hey, we're gonna show it to a lot of people or we're gonna share it only to a few because, and, um, and so, so anyway, so they make that decision. And so you as a publisher still put a lot of content out there, but it, it does not really make, um, it doesn't guarantee that it'll get seed. So it's seen, so it's a really big problem. Oh, absolutely. I think what happened in France and challenging, uh, challenging those decisions and, and push those social networks to be, uh, to be more open about it. Because what's happening, right, is that, again, somebody right now decides what is art, what is not, what is worth seeing and what is not. And right now it happens to be Facebook, right? And um, so, yes, definitely challenge it. his head already here we are so I think this this what Andre just said about um, there's someone who decides what is art and what is not that would be a pretty good point for you to pick up on isn't it um, so Emil has runs an Instagram account which is I think it's bot free yeah 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 sure. so it's totally bot free but nonetheless it's very All successful human. And uh, it's called Daily Paintings, and you're going to tell us more about it now. Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you for having me here. It's, it's an honor to be here. So uh, I actually brought my own photo photographer here. The hubris is so big here, but you know, content is king for me. So I need, to, I need, to, I need to have someone. Do you have the clicker? Is the clicker okay? Here. Does it work? Uh, check. It should. Yeah. So, my name, uh, I run Daily Paintings, which is uh, one of the bigger art accounts on Instagram. Uh, is anyone here a follower? Well, oh yeah, this, there's a bunch of them, you, yeah. It's not uphill all the way. Um, so, every day I post uh, paintings to 160,000 followers that I have. And I, I try to add a reflection or a story to the post I make. Um, usually I have a weekly theme, an artist, a region, or uh, an art movement. Like this week we have Gustav Kaibot. How, how do you pronounce that? My, Kaibot. Yeah, my French will be so bad during this presentation. So uh, be bear with me. Um, but I also travel to different museums uh, and explore them live uh, together with my followers. You could say that my thing, if there's actually one, is that I'm not, I'm not an art historian. I'm, uh, I'm a person that just loves art. And I try to explore and discover new art together with my followers, which, uh, have, yeah, that's a nice picture of me, thanks. <laughs> Uh, so, first some um, uh, background. Oh, uh, wait, I'm just going to say that I think this kind of consumption of art on social media will s actually change uh, the art canon in the future, how we view art. Um, but first I'm going to have some background on me. Uh, I work as a journalist at, at Swedish television, uh, and I've been doing that for a couple of years. Yeah, sorry. Is that better? Sorry. Um, yeah, and I actually work with sports, which surprises many people because uh, they're not used to see a, a sports guy that loves art or an art guy that loves sports. Uh, but that apparently works for me. So I got into art. I, I wasn't actually a sports guy. I was a, an art guy. Uh, I was into music. Um, I was a, an, an aspiring rock star, actually, you can see here. Uh, and I needed to something to pay my bills, so I went to university. In Sweden, you get paid to go to university. That's 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 an odd thing, right? Uh, and um, yeah, I jumped on this art uh, university course for half a year, 
And it was really great for me because I discovered so much that I hadn't known before. And uh, rock ambitions went nowhere, sorry. Uh, this was way back, you know, uh, it was 15 years ago and uh, I really uh, I really had this like lovely teachers that were, were inspiring me to love art and know more about art. It was like a Wikipedia, like we went through all the like timeline of art, art history. You learned like pretty much something about every time period or art movement. But the course ended and I actually lost contact with art, like the everyday art. So it's about the same thing with, uh, with Andre, that I, I wanted art to be more like everyday. I want to have art in my life every day. So I went on to Instagram and I couldn't, because I was there every day on Instagram, but I actually couldn't find any accounts. Maybe I'm, a, I'm pretty bad at searching. But I started daily paintings. Um, this was in August 2015. Uh, and I, I actually didn't know that much about art or art history or the art world. Uh, and the, in the beginning, it was slow. I think I had 1,000 followers uh, after one year. Uh, and, and that's a lot of people, right? Like 1,000 people looking at your art curation. I was thrilled that anyone would look at, look at what I did. Uh, now it's been four years, and now we're here. So every day, every week, my content is shown to 1.7 million times to a, about a quarter of a million people. But can I really say my content? It's actually thanks to you guys, uh, people here, organizations and GLAM and everything that makes this possible for me to have this account and share, share uh, art or the love for art with other people. Uh, I'm very thankful for that. Thanks, guys. So, art is going social, and a big chunk of that is thanks to you. Uh, and to those of you who read my short but sweet introduction here, uh, uh, I'm saying that this will change the art canon in the future. Uh, and I guess there's a lot of people here that have some kind of higher level education. Uh, so I'm going to try to prove my point that this will change the art canon with some kind of scientific method, my statistics my data, if you will. So, as of today, I've posted uh, 3,659 paintings on my account, and I analyzed the data and found out which 100 paint paintings that are my most popular ones. So, I define popular the same way Instagram in general defines popularity, by engagement, likes, comments, clicks, and private shares. So, uh, I got some interesting insights from, from, from this anal analysis. Uh, which artist do you think uh, has the most paintings on, on the Daily Paintings Top 100? Do you understand? Like, I, there are 100 paintings. Which artists do you think are the most frequent ones on that list? Do you have any takers? Any guesses? Who's the most popular artist on internet? Van Gogh? Okay, anyone else? Sorry? Rembrandt, okay. So, I'll give you the list. Yeah, this is the subject. So, number one, Van Gogh. Number two, René Magritte. Uh, number three, Egon Schiele. Edward Hopper. And number five, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Is that any surprises to you guys? No? Yeah, they're probably the most popular uh, artists at the museums as well. So, but what actually stood out in these statistics was that the lack of interest in names, the big names, uh, what mattered was the painting in itself and not like, Van Gogh wasn't like on the top uh, 20 actually on my list. That's surprising to me, at least. I found out that um, there was 53 different uh, artists, uh, that, like different artists on this list, and only 15 of those, uh, or only 15 of 100, were featured more than once on this list. So 
like the, the list of artists were very diverse. Um, but I want I, I said that in, in the introduction on the website that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, talk to you about the internet's most popular painting. And um, yeah, when I say the internet, I actually mean daily paintings, which is the only source I have. So, uh, but and this is of course based on the the group of followers that I have, which is a lot of people, 160,000 unique people uh, follow my account. But still, there's this group maybe follow me because my uh, because they share my specific taste in art. For example, I post way more Scandinavian art than your usual art influencer, if there's any more art influencers out there. Uh, I post more 19th century art than 16th century art and so forth. Uh, but uh, when, as I looked on the statistics or the data, I see that uh, it's, di it's diverse. It's not like from one artist or from one art movement or one period of time. So it, it's diverse. So, here we go. This is the most popular painting on the internet. Surprised? Yes. Yeah. This uh, is Spirit by Georges Roux. Part of my French. Uh, it was painted in 1885. Uh, how many of you have seen this painting before? Hands up. How many? Be truthful. One. That's good. You, you, you love art. <laughs> Uh, so, this was uh, exhibited uh, the same year it was made, at the Paris Salon. And on July 8, two, 2009, Christie's were com uh, commissioned to sell this painting. It was estimated to, to go for 10,000 to 15,000 pounds, but I actually couldn't find the hammer price, or if it was even sold at that uh, auction. Uh, so, this was, uh, as you can imagine, not the most popular painting uh, on Christie's, or not even on that actual auction. Isn't that something? That the internet's most popular painting is estimated to go for 10,000 to 15,000, but actually no one has seen this painting before. So, I posted this painting on f July 1st this year, and since then, and it's mostly on that day, 336,000 people has, uh, saw it on their screens. <clears throat> and of course, I'm not the first one to post it. I'm just the men messenger or the platform uh, where people share the painting with their friends. So what does this mean? That a fairly unknown painting is the most popular painting on the internet for the future of art history. I think that this will make art history a bit more democratic. People in general may start having an opinion of their own and not only go after the big names. A good painting is a good painting is a good painting. So maybe it's like when people start to read the Bible for themselves instead of uh, the priest telling them what the Bible actually said, you know, those hundred years ago. Um, here's three paintings that are actually very popular on daily paintings. Albert Aublé, Céline, Emile Friant, Lovers, and Jean-Léon Jean Jérôme, uh, The Truth Comes Out of, uh, of the Well. Do you know what these three paintings has, have in common? Sorry? No? No? They were all embraced by the Paris Salon. Um, and I, I don't know if... Uh, I don't know if this is right or correct, but when I studied art history, we were thought, uh, taught how the impress Impressionist painters were refused by the Paris Salon and managed to create their own scene, which later conquered the whole art scene. Uh, in retrospect, those who were embraced by the Paris Salon were somewhat looked down upon, at least when I studied and when I studied. They, they looked on the Paris Salon embraced artists like fakes or not real artists in that sense. Um, but actually, uh, many of these Paris Salon artists are very popular on daily paintings, but so are the Impressionists. There's no conflict. I guess that many of my followers aren't educated art historians, just people who love art. 
So they don't need to take any sides in any conflict where whether painting is considered good or not. So to conclude, I want to say a few words on the problems with this new forum, social media for art. Yes, there are problems and it's spelled populism. Social media can be a fast pace fast paced place and my hunch is it's easier to grasp simple art on social media. Art that, had to, art that doesn't take much time to be affected by. If you go back to this popular painting, Spirit by George Roux, uh, oh. <laughs> we can see that it's a lovely painting, and you can, uh, but one could say that it's a bit theatrical or even pompous. And to be fair, we all hear about algorithms these days, and that actually affects what kind of content everyone is posting. So if you post a cute dog uh, like this uh, on your personal Instagram account, people may like it and you may start like posting more uh, Instagram account, uh, uh, cute dogs. Um, and that's like how it works for the professional accounts like mine as well. You, you post more because of one artist or one like motive if you see that many people like it if you may or not be oblivious to it. So that was my presentations. Uh, I had one minute, I, I hope I didn't. <laughs> That's all right, you That's don't right. get, you know. Thank you yeah, very yeah, much. Thanks, thanks. I was gonna say, we don't cut the, the, the volume. Yeah, just was, after, you were waiting for that, right? Yeah, sometimes you wanna do that, but not this yeah, time. Yeah, this time, no. Um, Thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's it's really interesting to have this like directly after what Andre presented because um, you know you were talking about the same same sort of stuff how things get shared because they're popular and how uh, different things are popular than what we might assume. I'm gonna attack Andre out of his phone <laughs> consumption there. <laughs> Sorry to do that to you. No, 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 but I just, I thought like, but I want to ask you, do you, would you agree with that what you are seeing, what is very popular with your bots is totally different from what you'd expected? Yeah, so I think that the point, uh, do I need a microphone? Sorry. For the internet, you need a microphone. Yeah, so, so the big point here is uh, what Emil, Emil uh, said is that, you know, once you, popularity dictates your sharing choices in the future. Mm -hmm. And I try to program that out of my accounts so they don't, don't respond to that bias. But it's a very strong, um, it, it, the, the bias is there, right? So once, once something becomes trending and interesting, you tend to, to reinforce that. Right, but but isn't it that was what you're saying? Isn't it that, uh, as you said, it's, it is as if the people start reading the Bible by themselves instead of being told what is valuable to read. So what you're saying is that when they get access um, and tell us what is popular, that's actually what the people want to see. So we should serve them that. Uh, yeah, well, I don't I know. What I can see is that sometimes I'm like dubious if in, if I want to share a painting because I think it's kitsch or like mm, pompous or theatrical. Um, what, what was your question? Well, the question was um, because uh, Andre said he's trying to program it out of the bots that, oh, yeah. that they do overshare the stuff that is popular. Yeah. And you said you think it's really interesting to see what is popular because that tells us what, uh, what the art canon actually should be. Yeah, actually, I, I'm not trying to be unbiased like the bots. I think this is my creation. As I said, I post way more like Scandinavian art or 19th century art than 16th century art. So, uh, and I actually got a question on my comments the other day and they were like saying, are you only posting Scandinavian art? Is <laughs> that a, like a, is, do I need to be Scandinavian to be posted on your account? And I said, no, but it's actually like, I share whatever I want, and they can't see me as like an unbiased in that sense that I, like the bots, they share everything in you know, like a database. Yeah, right. There's a question here. Yeah. Um, thank you for a uh, really interesting presentation, both of you. Um, I think what's really interesting in this, I'm going to make more of a statement than a question, but I think it's something that really occurs, really struck us at the Met, is between like, Ultimately, to your question, like you know, there's bias in what you call bias and what you're doing, but you have your own business goals, 
for sharing the kind of art you're doing. Yeah. And likewise with the bots, you have your own take on it. I think the key thing for us institutions, because these kinds of things are part of the texture of how people discover art, how our missions are served. I think the important thing for museums now is just to position ourselves in relationship to them and to find where there is that crossover, because there is crossover. There, is, there are places where what you're doing really serves a museum's mission, and there are places where it doesn't. And we just got to find those areas of crossover and, and, and use them. Right? So I think what the two of you are doing is super interesting and where museums need to really engage and figure out where that crossover actually happens. Mm. I think it's really cool. Mm. Right. right. Any more questions? Yeah, can you just pass it on to Andrea? Thank you. Um, so I have a question about, uh, you mentioned, well, it's kind of a two-part question. The yeah. first is, in terms of the 100 top artists, yeah. um, how many of those were women or people of color? And then following on that, because you mentioned that you know this has a potential to disrupt the canon of the future, what types of biases are we replicating by not challenging and curating some of the bias of the past in that process? Yeah, exactly. That, that was something that, uh, to answer your last question first, that's like the thing. It's hard for us to, like, this is my creation and I come from somewhere, like, or, like my history in art and, every, and where I come from and my gender and my age. So that, that makes, like, everything biased. So, I think it's actually up to like people in. Uh, uh, I, I think it's up to people to make their own like feed that have di di come from different places because they can't. Uh, I, c I can't be charged for not being like the uh, uh, unbiased person or a curator that is like the creation here. It's it's made by a human being so. But uh, with the first part, the first part of your question is that is that uh, if someone is uh, how many were women and how many were people of color, and I don't have those statistics. I'm sorry, but they're actually not that many. And I try to like be more uh, aware of that. And we we actually have like Women's Week or like I had last week. I had a non-Western week. Yes, to be be able to share because my what I see my mission is uh, to share new like to discover new art with people and yet not just po post like big names Van Gogh or Monet or Magritte because that teases or tickles the the algorithm. But it, that's that, that's the problem I think with populism that makes. Uh, makes it hard, but I, w what I saw was that uh, it, it's actually not the like big names that uh, depends on uh, on how uh, how popular the, the painting is. The second most popular painting is uh, is by a Chinese artist, contemporary artist, uh, a non-Western one. So. Can I add to that real quick? So, uh, so this is the question that I get a lot, right? Like, why aren't there many female bots and, and bots of color? And so, um, since I import all of my data from um, public collections, right, whatever bias is present there in the data, it gets translated into, uh, you know, what is easy to share. And so I think that's kind of like, it, it goes back, right? Even though I don't have any intention to discriminate, uh, but the data is already set in such a way that it favors, you know, a very specific group. So big problem, and um, you know, I think in, in 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 some cases, right, we we just need to take extra, you know, time to figure out, hey, like you know, there's so many women, um, like in American abstract expressionism, right? So many wonderful women, but everybody only knows Jackson Pollock and de Kooning. Yeah. Thank you for that, Andre. There was another question here, and I think that needs to be the last question. Do we have any questions on, on the internet? No questions from the internet? No questions Good. on the internet? I would also like to comment on the um, gender aspect of yes. your um, statistics, because I mean, in the moment where um, we share statistics like that and call them, for example, the most popular images on the internet and then present five male artists, that also is kind of this um, inheritance of bias that you just mentioned. Because, of course, um, this goes back to the museum and the museum collection, and especially if you look, for example, at digital collections, because museums also choose the, those artworks that they want to digitize. And if um, Van Gogh, for example, is always the most 
um, famous or the most popular um, painter, they are going always to start with that painting first and not the one that are, ones that are um, that have been neglected in the past. So you're, I, I think, Andrea, you're totally right with these bias inherited. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Emil, thank for you. sharing your experience and um, <laughs> your strategies. Sorry to keeping like the tension up with getting the image in and out all the time, but um, we're now um, approaching this block of lightning talks where uh, the presenter has like, uh, yeah, please take a nice picture of us, where the presenter has only five um, up to 10 minutes to present his idea uh, or um, the point he or she wants to make. And I said earlier that I could go back to those seven years when I started the National Museum, blah, blah, blah. But uh, actually, another turning point at the National Museum, in my opinion, was when um, communication and digitization started to work together, actually. So please meet my wonderful colleague, Anna Jansson, who is um, uh, responsible for PR and sponsorship um, at the National Museum. And you know you've done something right when people say, you know, a different thing, but they use your own slides. So this is like so wonderful to see this on, on, on screen. So please, Anna, tell us about um, Open Glam and PR. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm also one of the organizers of this conference, so I'm eager to keep the schedule. So I'm going to speed things up. And if you are a PR or marketing person here, please reach out to me during the social program later on. Um, when we at the museum tell people, both in the business and outside, that we have released photos of two-dimensional artworks where the artists no longer have copyright into the public domain, the reactions are always positive. But of course, we also do get questions like, what happens if someone develops a product for commercial use based on your collections and actually make money of it? Or if someone, let's say a politician, uses your images for his or her campaign, what about your brand? Well, if someone actually would develop a really successful product and make money of it, uh, good for them. What probably would happen is that we would want to sell it in our museum shop, because we would then would be able to buy just the amount we expect to sell, rather than the quantities you would need to buy if you wanted to develop a product of your own, meaning we too would make money. And in terms of politicians and images being used for political purposes, you could never control the images to begin with. Nothing changes just by putting them in the public domain because bad people will do bad things always. Only now good people can do good things. So we are the facilitators of the collections but should not have patent on the discussion. Images being used and being visible actually benefits us, I would say. Why? Well, when talking about our brand, National Museum, we must always remember, in my PR and marketing opinion, that our unique selling point is that we have the originals. This is our offer. We can provide meaningful encounters between art and people. And I will be the first to admit that National Museum, aka me, as the social media manager, will never be able to compete with you, Emil, or with your bots. Uh, but it's not a competition, because the point is that art belongs to all of us, and everyone will benefit from art being spread online, even the museums. Because when you, want to, when you will, if you want to see the artwork in real life, or perhaps get updated on the research behind it, you will be welcome here to the museum. So last year, we had 90 million views of our museum's name, the brand name, National Museum, in social media. So Karin, you said you had 17 million views of the 5,000 uh, artworks on Wikimedia, uh, but PR1, we had 90 million views of the brand name. Uh, and of course, uh, the media coverage of the reopening was huge, but 
the biggest parts of those numbers are uh, users in so social media sharing our images, like the bots, thank you. Um, but the users also are doing things that we wouldn't do, or at least that I wouldn't do. Uh, like this meme, um, and I know to some museums doing memes and joking about the collections is a social media strategy, but it, it isn't ours. Um, we should provide information and stimulate creativity, and sure, we can have humor, but let's be honest, museum staff aren't always the best at everything, and some things you might want to leave to the public. And I actually believe that how images can be relevant in a digital age is one of them. Our job as a museum is to make sure that the information and expertise that we have, too, is available online. So when you have stopped laughing about this odd pornographic painting from the early 18th century, and actually might want to know more about it, we should make sure that the information is available online. Acknowledging that we do not own knowledge but share it has impacted my way of thinking in terms of brand awareness and PR strategy online. For instance, I will never be able to compete with IKEA's budget for social media, but I don't have to. They know that they can use our images and through them the brand that I am representing is profiting from their reach in social media. And in a relevant way, people are being inspired by IKEA to go explore our collections online. So last but not least, open licensing will change your attitude. When acknowledging that the museum is not the main user of the collection, you will very quickly evolve from monologue to dialogue. And that is a PR strategy I personally consider to be a must for every museum in the 21st century. So openness is about going from exclusivity into inclusivity, and it applies to all departments of a museum, even PR and marketing. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, and I won't give you the chance to ask any questions to Anna, but as she said, Jill, you can find her um, uh, tonight at dinner or um, during the breaks. And now I would like to welcome David Haskia on stage, who is um, leading a team at the National Heritage Board. Uh, what would that be called in English? Uh, it has a very bad name in English, so oh, it's called the it. Digital Dissemination Unit. Okay. Um, Digital dissemination, yeah. yeah, right. So you're supposed to help Swedish museums with disseminating their stuff online, so exactly what we're doing. But you're now talking about um, uh, an art installation that was actually on show at the Photographic Museum, right? And I don't know how to work Google Slides, but you do. Yeah, I do. So, um, let's see here, there's some weird pop-ups here. Uh, there we go. Is this working? So, why this cryptic title? Because um, this is a lightning talk about a particular art installation, but mostly it's about what we can learn from it in terms of uh, how we can uh, reach and reach out and do outreach towards uh, contemporary artists. And this artist, uh, his name is Rafik Anadol. He's active in uh, the US, he's originally from Turkey. He told me when I interviewed him about this uh, piece called Latent History that he was eight years old when he first saw Blade Runner. And that's when he decided that he wanted to be an artist because he wanted to be able to create the sort of futuristic city that is the backdrop of Blade Runner, and um, that's uh, and Blade Runner the book, uh, the book behind the film was originally called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, so that's sort of where my weird title came from. So I learned about this video installation completely, sort of by chance. Um, it just popped up in my regular news feed, and I checked it out because I kind of like this uh, algorithmic art. And then I saw this little thing in the press release saying, and uh, Rafik used a lot of imagery coming from Swedish Open Cultural Heritage, which is actually the aggregator that we work with uh, at our team. And I just had no idea that this was uh, coming up. 
so I interviewed him and uh, he just applied and got an API key just like any other user, which is fine. They don't need uh, all to inform me. Uh, but I thought this was really interesting because it was it's the first reuse case I think in, in in our aggregator in like 10 years that is actually about creating a new completely original artwork so um, I wanted to see if I could just give you a little bit of a sense of the experience of the artwork uh, video doesn't do, do scale very well but you can see the silhouettes here uh, the artwork itself uh, reuses tens of thousands of images from the Swedish National Aggregator from museum collections, but also images drawn from Instagram from people who have posted images of Stockholm. And then it's sort of projected in this big space, uh, and it also has music, uh, and it's sort of this immersive experience. Here you could see brief flashes of, this is AI generated artwork, so you, uh, what you could see there were sort of visualizations of the AI classifying all these photos into different uh, categories. And then what Rafik does is that he programs the AI, and the AI itself then generates new images of Stockholm based on the existing ones. Uh, weird computer generated versions of Stockholm, a Stockholm that never existed and probably never will. Uh, so this is a bit about the artwork. Uh, I will pause there and go on with the presentation, uh, if I can. Yeah. So when I spoke with Rafik, I also asked him what advice did he have to any uh, museum or archive or library or aggregator who would like to encourage the creation of new artworks based on, on their holdings. And here are three takeaways. Uh, and they also gel very well with, uh, uh, with what a lot of us, I think, already know. So, first of all, uh, remember that developers are users too. Uh, make your APIs as friendly to work with as possible. Uh, make it really easy to sign up to, to get an API. Design the documentation for the API in such a way that it's easy to get started, and so on. Just because developers tend to be very good at computers, that's no good reason to offer them a bad user experience. And then uh, he mentioned how, so Blade Runner was his original impetus to become an artist. And he had produced a lot of video art and other uh, image-based art before this residency he had at Google Arts and Culture. But that's where he first learned about machine learning and AI. And he says that, that was a transformative experience for him. And I also know that there are other organizations like the Library of Congress, I think for a while, also had an artist in residence. Many of us know about the Wikipedian in residence uh, thing, but this whole in residence model could be extended in many different ways. X in residence, it could be a 3D artist like I spoke with Tom Flynn about uh, this, this morning, or it could be a visual artist like Rafik and Adol. Invite them to come sit in your institution, work with your collection, uh, draw from the expertise of your uh, team members. And then uh, one thing he said during the uh, interview was knowledge is an artist's uh, pigment. And what he meant by that is that as, uh, apart from the whole residency model, uh, he felt that the way we present our collections on the web makes it very difficult to get a, you can find the individual objects uh, if you know what to look for, but if you don't know what to look for, it's very difficult to get a sense and understanding of, of what is inside. Uh, he says that uh, you need to get away from, from the search box and you need to get away from designing your web experiences in a way that is uh, basically uh, recreates a, a physical shelf system. Um, and um, this gels very well with the movement towards generous interfaces and data visualization. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, and he says that un unless, and another way of, of sharing this knowledge what's inside the collection is really this thing. Allow artists to work directly with subject matter expertise uh, uh, colleagues in your institution. Because the more they know and understand about what the collection represents, the better art he feels that an artist can create. Thank you.
Thank you, David. And the same applies here. So uh, you can't ask any questions now, but you're welcome to catch David during the evening. And before um, we go for our tours, I want to announce the last presentation of uh, today. And that is um, a project that I like so much, I gave him double the time. So <laughs> here's, here's John Back from Scan the World to talk about um, Scan the World in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. You can get a mic too. Perfect. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, I'm going to do a bit of a stage for you having to wait for me for so long. I'm going to pass you some 3D prints um, and I'll get started. So, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a huge honor to be uh, presenting alongside such amazing speakers we've had so far. Uh, my name is Jonathan Beck. I'm an artist and advocate for 3D uh, technologies and open data. Uh, I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Scan the World, uh, which has become the leading community built platform for 3D printable objects of cultural significance. So, in this lightning talk, we'll talk about Scan the World's history, we'll talk about our community efforts, and discuss what potential there is to be had when you make your collections open and 3D printable. So, for some context, I started Scan the World just over seven years ago. Uh, after dis uh, discovering the democratized nature of 3D technologies through using devices such as my smartphone and open source software, I took to 3D scanning sculptures in museums, but all without their permission. The end goal was to release them openly to subvert museums and bring culture to the masses. So on one cloudy day, I found my first victim, which was the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and scanned over 300 sculptures of their collection, uh, armed with just my smartphone. So the resulting models were produced by harnessing a process called photogrammetry, which in essence is the process of taking a series of overlapping photographs, like there, uh, of an object to produce a 3D representation of it. These photographs were stitched together and uh, in turn turned into 3D models using open source software such as Blender and Meshroom. Just so that you know, these 300 models cost me absolutely nothing to produce. So now these models needed a home, so I teamed up with a company called My Mini Factory and it took off from there. So a little plug to My Mini Factory here. <laughs> um, My Mini Factory is the leading website for 3D creatives, which is producing a decentralized ecosystem for people wanting to share 3D printable models, designs and objects. So taking a decentralized approach to our platform allows for us to focus on sort of object-oriented narratives, uh, encouraging shared object ownership and a much more inclusive community. Um, everything which is uploaded to the platform is curated, so as well as being manually checked for it being 3D printable, all objects on Scan the World are assigned with appropriate metadata and backlinks to the original institution's uh, online databases. This also includes the Creative Commons licenses that they choose to have. So it turns out that a lot of people are really into photogrammetry. Uh, so I started conducting art heists en masse in the form of a thing called a scanathon, whereby we'd enter a museum all together, armed with our cameras, and photograph every object in the collection, as long as it was out of IP. So as word of the initiative spread, we started to receive data sets from all across the world. Interestingly, submissions weren't coming through from Western galleries uh, in Europe and America, but also from smaller, more rural communities from India and China who wanted to share three-dimensional representations or copies of their heritage with the world. So fast tracking to now, Scan the World has become the largest platform of 3D printable artifacts, hosting over 16,000 free to download objects in its collection. The project recently collaborated with Wikimedia. We're helping them with building their 3D infrastructure and providing some of the first 3D models to their platform, as well as Google Arts and Culture to help broaden the scope of Scan the World's community efforts. We've had over 60 million visitors in the past couple of years, and a total of around 4,000 objects are downloaded each day. With the data tracked so we can build trend reports on each collection, as well as getting insights into individual objects. More recently, uh, we have set up external teams in India to share knowledge of democratized 3D technologies, like mentioned, with the aim to generate new skill sets for entrepreneurs and spread awareness of the country's rich heritage. 
So as well as having a focus, or a large focus on community, data is also acquired through official collaborations with museums. Over 50 supporting institutions have found their home on Scan the World, and their data, even that which is created by myself, is owned entirely by them. So all the work with the, well, all the work that I do with these museums are completely done free of charge. Um, so working in tune with the pulse of the museum and by following their digital strategies means that I can tailor my work around their intentions. So whether that be for education and running more scanathons or workshops, for accessibility or research projects, or in the case of my two most recent collaborations, to open, da open data uh, to the world for, to further human creativity. So these two museums were the wonderful SMK <laughs> and the National Museum. Um, so the scanning completed with the National Museum was undertaken to work in harmony with their open access policy, pushing to increase interest in art and art history by making their digital resources as accessible as possible. Over the course, we taught internal staff about the technology, digitizing over 70 sculptures, and all of which will be made available to download on Scan the World under a CC0 license. That's surprisingly big, <laughs> I didn't realize how big that was. Um, I won't, I'll be exploring 3D scanning a little bit later. I've got myself set up in the sculpture yard to do some scanning with you guys. So I won't speak about that just now. Instead, I'll speak about 3D printing. Um, so with 3D printers starting at under $100 now, it's clear to see that we're getting past this slump phase of the technology's growth and we're entering a new productive era. Um, the, the slump made it to its worst point when America decided it would be a really good idea to legalize the release of CAD files for a gun, which they aptly named the Liberator. Debunking this, uh, using a 3D printed gun is naturally very, very dangerous, uh, even when using these provided templates and there's an almost certain possibility that the file or the gun will blow up in your hand rather than fire a bullet. Um, also, please ignore what the movies say. Uh, in Ocean's 8, Helena Bonham Carter famously 3D scans and 3D prints a Cartier diamond necklace in the space of five minutes. This is also not true. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, if you can't print a gun nor steer and steal a necklace, what uses are there for 3D printing? <laughs> so, firstly, consider what a museum's collection means to those who are visually impaired or might have other disabilities. Museums are busy spaces, audio tours are available, but perhaps not entirely immersive. Touch tours work, but this can also run the risk of damaging artworks over time. So by, by providing cheap to produce uh, copies in any scale in a matter of hours uh, allows for a direct tactile response to an object. A member of the Victoria and Albert Museum's digital learning team uh, recently visited Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital armed with a 3D printer and a scans from the VNA. So this exercise not only enabled uh, the children to learn about the museum that they're not able to visit just yet, but also allows them to have fun with remixing the artworks and manipulating them, subsequently being able to create a 3D printed postcard of, of the museum forever. Um, knowledge is an important step about, uh, uh, about art is an important step into our development. Uh, Object-based learning has been proven a successful means of education. Uh, 3D prints can be manipulated and seen from any angle, uh, meaning that a student's relationship to a piece can be a lot more intimate. Also, as mentioned before in scanathons, uh, attendees are able to learn both about the art and the technology without the technology being fetishized and keeping the focus on the original piece. Uh, having copies of your collection um, available to be played with and built upon allows for a plethora of possibilities. So remixing and reinterpretations of a museum collection um, sort of allows for a new voice to be added to this ecosystem. Uh, the Staten's Museum for Kunst have been releasing their 3D models openly to encourage younger audiences who are brought up in the digital or internet age to reconnect with their culture and have the ability to remix works of their ancestors. So on a similar note, here are some examples of what the uh, Scan the World community have recently made with objects from our collection. Um, here's a sculpture which was made for a Mardi Gras float. <laughs> It was sculptures being used in an interior design project. This guy used all of the sculptures from Scan the World and turned it into his living room. Uh, sculptures being used as mannequins. 
models here were being used in the uh, VR Museum of Fine Art, which was made off the back of some, uh, someone from our uh, community. It's a non-profit little project that they worked on. Um, but yes, in order to do a lot of this, it means that your data must be open and you must embrace more so the power of communities. So whoops, we know that only two to 4% of museum collections are on public display. The internet here can make these collections accessible and in turn help inspire new knowledge, creativity, access and innovation beyond the museum's walls, as well as encouraging new audiences to visit or support our museum. Now, this isn't to say that you must release your data openly, um, but don't be surprised if your community do it for you. And you shouldn't be afraid of this. So take this as a final quote uh, by Nora and Jan, who did the next Nefertiti project. Uh, there are ways in which we don't even need any top-down effort from institutions or museums, but where the people can reclaim the museums as their public space through alternative virtual realities, fiction, or captivating the objects like we did. So thank you very much for uh, listening. In the meantime, please do look out for any crazed visitors taking hundreds of photographs in your galleries. They might just be a friend of Scan the World. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.